now. Yeah, so we start the recording now. Welcome everyone to the Quarto workshop um, by Julia Müller. Uh, my name is Pascal Kieslich. I'm a data scientist at Merck Healthcare based in Darmstadt, Germany. The, the R Pharma conference organizers asked me to help with hosting the session. And I'm really looking forward to what Julia will present us about Quarto in the next two hours. Before we start, I was also asked to do some housekeeping. So I'll just um, give you some information up front. And while I do this, I will also post the relevant links in the meeting chat. As the workshop is uh, tied to the r and Pharma conference, it would be great if you also sign up for the r and Pharma conference if you haven't done so yet. As I said, um, I'll just post the, um, meet uh, the link in the meeting chat now. Um, we also have a code of conduct so um, for the workshop, so please respect, um, have respect for everyone and create a very welcoming environment. Please stay also mute unless the speaker asks um, that you come off mute. Um, the, for those of you who would like to um, have digital credentials, we will offer them for via Credly for those of you who attend more than 75% of the time. And it will happen in the way that after you exit the Zoom, um, you will get a survey where you can enter your um, details if you would like to get this credit. And if this uh, pop-up does not occur for you, you can also reach out to us via email. And I will also um, post the email address um, in the Zoom chat here. As I said before, the session is being recorded, and we will also post the video on the YouTube channel of the Arm Pharma um, conference. This will take some time, so a few months probably, because they will also do some editing before. And lastly, the material um, Julia provides is openly available from GitHub, and we also share her um, GitHub repository link in the meeting chat. If you have any questions during the workshop, um, feel free to just post them in the meeting chat. Um, I will also monitor it and also make Julia aware in case some questions come up. Um, and before I hand over to Julia, I just want to give you a quick introduction to her. She's currently working on her um, PhD in English Linguistics at the University of Freiburg in Germany. She co-organizes the local Our Ladies chapter as well as the Julia Gender in Inclusive, which is a similar in initiative for the Julia programming language. Um, she's passionate about programming, um, about accessible programming and statistics education. Her cat, the tiny bear, is suing and explaining to people that linguistics don't actually judge people how they talk. And I'm very much looking forward to know what she will teach us about Quarto today. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you for the lovely introduction. And uh, thanks everyone for joining, even though, as I understand, it's really early for some of you. So I really appreciate that. Um, before I share my screen and show you my slides, I want to start with a quick poll. So I hope this works. You should see a poll that asks, have you used Quarto before? Uh, never, once or twice, several times or often. So just me let me know. <laughs> this is an introduction, so I'm kind of hoping that most people will say never or once or twice, um, because if you've used it often, then yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, most people are saying never once or twice, so that's perfect. I'll show you everything you need to get started. Okay, I'll just stop the poll here. Yeah, so most people are saying never, 70%, once or twice, 22% several times, 7%, and often 0%. And that's kind of what I was hoping for. And I see someone saying the chat have not. OK, yeah. Thanks for that. So that's actually perfect um, because, yeah, this is an introduction. So I don't expect you to know anything, really. Um, OK, so with that, I'm going to share my screen. And you should be able to see my slides now. Let me know in the, in the chat if it doesn't work. You can see them. You can see them. OK. So, yeah, I had a slide introducing myself, but um, I've already gotten this lovely introduction, uh, so I don't really need to say much more than that. Yeah, I am working on a PhD in English linguistics. I'm researching the interaction between a person's first language and a person's second language and what happens when they read and process language. So I was really surprised and, and excited to be asked um, to, to give this workshop because I have nothing to do with pharma. So that was a nice um, surprise. And um, as a little incentive to stick around for the entire workshop, I do have a cat and I identify as a cat lady. And um, if you stick around long enough, you'll see some pictures. 
Okay, so what is Quarto? So Quarto is a publishing system uh, that lets you combine code, R code, um, and code output. So plots or tables or model estimates or whatever else you can create with R code, but also text to describe um, the code or to write about yeah, what you did and what you found. Uh, the output formats that we can have are really varied. We can use this for just documents, articles, presentations, slides, websites, books, blogs. People use it for all kinds of output formats. And we can, so Quarter can give us HTML, PDF, um, Microsoft Word, Microsoft PowerPoint, um, yeah, files. So this is also really flexible. Um, I find this really useful because when you work in Microsoft Word or another word processor, formatting is often an issue. You know, when you move one picture and then it messes up the entire formatting of the document and stuff like that doesn't happen in Quarto. So that this is, yeah, a lot less of a headache. And in terms of research, because I do come from this academic research background, it helps make research more reproducible. You can easily, um, show your code, handle any modifications to the code. You can add data or analyses to a document, and it even takes care of references and bibliography for you, which I'll show you later. Okay, um, as for the, yeah, if that sounds familiar, if that sounds <laughs> at all familiar, it is because it's very similar to our Markdown. So if you know our Markdown pretty well, you'll find it pretty easy to switch to Quarto if you do want to switch, right? But um, our Markdown still exists and I don't think they'll they'll kill it off, right? Um, so, but why should you consider switching to Quarto? Um, it's a bit better at handling these different output formats like um, blogs or posters or books. So it can do it all in one. And with our Markdown, sometimes you'd need additional packages to handle that. Uh, something that I was really excited about as well is that you can use it for other programming languages, for Python um, and for Julia, and you can also use it in Visual Studio Code. So you're not um, just limited to our studio, but if you're writing, for example, Python or Julia code and you use something like Visual Studio Code, Quarto works in that. Um, and yeah, also has a bunch of additional features compared to our Markdown and some of them I'll, I'll show you today. Okay, mm, you hopefully got an email with installation instructions. Um, you can download Quarto at this link and then it needs to be installed. So this is different from other, from our packages. Um, so you do have to download it and install it and then it'll be available. So once you've installed it and you open our studio, you can create a new document and it'll give you the option to create a Quarto document or Quarto slides. Okay, so how is this workshop going to work? Um, all the materials are on my GitHub and you should have the link. Let us know if you want, want us to send it again in the, in the chat. I'm going through the slides. So the slides are called Welcome to Quarto. Uh, this is an HTML, so you can see I'm in my browser. HTML opens in your browser. And what I would invite you to do, because this is a workshop and I, I want you to try these features out for yourself, um, is I invite you to open the file that's called Quarto Demonstration Start Here .qmd. And this will open in your RStudio. So this should look something like this. You should see my RStudio now. Um, and this is Quarto Demonstration Start Here QMD. This has some text and it has some code and I'll what will happen is I'll go through my slides, I'll show you some features, and then I'll invite you to try them out in this document, right? Okay, so something that's very convenient about Quarto, and you might be familiar with this because it's the same in our Markdown, um, when you save a Quarto document, the working directory is set to where, wherever you save the document, right? So it just sets the working directory to where the document is. That makes it really easy to read in files that are in the same folder. And also when you save outputs or when you export a graph or a data file that you've changed things in, they're also saved in that same folder. And the render document, so the document that is converted to HTML or PDF or Word, whatever the output format is, is also saved in exactly that same folder. And to render it, so instead of 
for Markdown, we said knitting. In Quarter, we say rendering, but it's the same idea. And you have this button at the top in our studio that says render with this arrow next to it. And if you click that, this document, this quarter document will be rendered to, in this case, um, HTML, right? Because we said format HTML. So that's how that works. That's how you get from uh, the quarter document to an HTML or PDF or Word document. Okay, so let's look at kind of the anatomy of a quarter um, document. We have the YAML, uh, same as in our markdown, that's the first section of the document at the top. It's framed by three hyphens on either side. And this contains things like the title, the name, the date, the output format, so HTML, PDF, Word, and so on. Um, this can all be changed and we can add a lot of things, a lot of information here. We can put a title, we can put a description, and we can also put this into a banner. So that's a box that, that can be a specific color or that can even be a picture. So at this point, I'll... Yes. One mm -hmm. question, and that yeah. is whether, whether you can also render um, from command line. Yeah, you can render it from command line. You'll have to look up for yourself how exactly to do that because I never do that, but I know that it's possible. Yeah, and also, yeah, if you need um, any additional information, because obviously Quarto is, a, you know, there are lots of options, lots of possibilities, and I'll just show you some, yeah, introductory um, things. The documentation on the website, so where you download it is actually really good, right? So here you can see a little bit of, yeah, an introduction um, of how to do it. And you have, when you click on guide, yeah, when you click on guide, you see all kinds of help pages, right? So for a question like that, um, I'd invite you to just look it up here, but I'm pretty sure it's possible. Okay, yeah, so at this point, I'll invite you to have, um, to play around with this dem demonstration file and enter a title and a description can also look at the date options. So we can enter a specific date, we can enter today or now or last modified. And then we have a bunch of author options and we can play around with this banner block. So let me show you what that looks like right now. So this is what it should look like for you. It's pretty empty, right? So we have a title, we don't have a description and you can see that um, this is empty and it shouldn't be empty, right? So we need to put in a description date is set to today you can play around with that and then author you can put in your name and then here you can add a link to your personal website or your twitter or something like that affiliation here you can for example um, enter the name of your uh, workplace your, your company or I, I could enter my university for example and then affiliation url you can set a link to that and people will be able to click on your name and be taken to that URL. And they will be able to click on affiliation and will be taken to that URL. Yeah, and then here with the title block banner, um, you can try and set a hex code to set a custom color. So just, I'd say, I'd say just play around with that for a few minutes. And once you're done, let me know in the chat, just type done in the chat so I know when you'd like me to move on. And I'm obviously here for any questions. So Julia, just a note, I'm not sure whether people got the installation for Quarterlink before, but they got, um, but I provided it in the chat again. Um, and I also provide the link to GitHub so you can, um, uh, you can get, um, also get the materials from GitHub there. Um, yeah, so, I just saw the question, if I don't have Quarto downloaded, will it work with the rendering? It shouldn't work. You need to download and install it. Yeah. Um, so this is all, everything's in one folder on my GitHub, right? And the file that you need right now is Quarto demonstration start here. That's what it's called. And there's another question about the place for the here QMD file. Maybe you can point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is all, this is the GitHub folder uh, as it looks like on my, on my computer. And it's just this file, quarter demonstration, start here. That's what, what I've invited you to work in. That was 
was another question how to set uh, if you could repeat how to set the color and yeah. set the date to the last modified date yeah so date we should be able to do something like last oops last hyphen modified modified okay mm, description i'll have to put something in i think it will uh complain if i don't and then here the title block banner so this will make a colorful um yeah box that all this information author and affiliation and the title of the document will go in and what we what we can do is set a um something like a hex code so i've looked one up earlier we can just play around like that right so you have these yeah, you have a format like this where you have a hex code and this should be some yellowish color. Okay, so a couple of people are done. Thanks for letting me know. Uh, I'll just quickly show you what, what I did, what it looks like for me. If you ever get totally lost, um, you can go to, you can open the quarter demonstration file and that will have some code in it. That is basically the solution to the exercises, right? So if you ever get really lost and don't, yeah, don't know how something works, you can always look at that and that'll have the code in it. Um, so what I've done here is I added a description, I left the date as today, um, entered my name, a link to my Twitter, affiliation as University of Freiburg, and then affiliation URL. This is a link to the Uni Freiburg website with my profile on it. And then this, yeah, this should be a kind of a yellow, I think I made a typo. <laughs> um, so because some people are saying it's actually a bluish green, which sounds much nicer um and then this is what it looks like so you have this um yeah green yellow ish you have the title the description and then my name my affiliation published date you can see i made this quite a while ago <laughs> so and now if i click on my name it'll take me to my twitter because that's what i linked it to and if i click on this university of freiburg link it'll take me to my profile on the Unifibook website. Okay, so these are a couple of options for the YAML. Great, so with that, uh, I'm going to continue. Yeah, I see the question for the PDF files. Um, I'm not sure, I'd have to try that out, but I guess, I guess it should work. I guess it should work, but I'd have to double check to make sure if that works in PDF as well as in HTML. Generally, H I'm going through HTML documents because they have a few more options in terms of kind of interactivity and user input. Um, and for Word and PDF, a lot of the features are the same. A lot of the options are the same and, and work the same. Um, but some things, um, yeah, just are not available in PDF or Word. Okay, so next we'll play around a little bit with the appearance and style of our document. So, within this html document um, option you can specify a theme and you can specify a highlight so the theme would be your font your colors of the text and so on there are a bunch of options and i've added a link for you to get an idea of what all of these look like and what you might yeah what you what you find beautiful or not and then the highlight that actually refers to, to the code chunks, we'll get to the code chunks um, later on. So for now, take a few minutes and have a look, pick a theme, maybe also a highlight, but first of all, pick a theme that you like. And the way this works, this is all in the YAML. We have format, then we need a line break and HTML indented. 
and then another line break. And then these are the, the options that refer to this HTML document. So the theme, the highlight, and we'll see a few more options later. So make sure that this indentation, that that is available and that that works, right? Otherwise it won't render properly. Okay, so a few minutes, just pick a theme that you like. Okay, I feel like we should continue. You can still post in the chat if you have a theme that you really like. Okay, so first we'll go through a couple of text options and then later we'll move on to code chunks and code options. Okay, so something that often trips people up is um, when you uh, want, to, want to actually have a line break in the rendered document and if you want empty lines it doesn't just work like in in word but you have to either add two spaces at the end of the, un, end of the line before you hit enter or you can hit enter twice and then it should work and if you have an empty line you can use this right so if you want an empty line so just like i have here actually here's an empty line and that's what i used i think someone is not muted if you could mute that would be great Thank you. Okay, so that's something that often trips people up, line breaks and empty lines. Then headers, you might be familiar with this. This is similar or exactly the same actually as in Markdown. You have one hashtag and to define the first level header, two for the second level, three for the third level and so on. And you can add subheadings that way. And these will translate into formatting. So the font sizes will decrease. You can see this is bigger than this, for example. Okay, then bold and italics, that also works exactly like it does in Markdown. You use asterisks um, and you need one set of asterisks, asterisks, difficult word, uh, for italics and two to make the text bold. All right, so that's what it looks like in the quarter document. And that's, oops, that's what it looks like in the rendered HTML or Word document. Then you can use block quotes to make a text or a sentence um, stand out. And you just use this bigger than sign for a block quote and the text will be shown like this. Okay, then you can have lists, unordered or ordered lists. Uh, so hyphens for unordered lists and numbers for ordered lists. And you can indent more by using spaces or tabs. So looks like this list item, another list item, and that's what it shows up as. And then we have this indentation with, I, I like to use four spaces with kind of, yeah, a more indented smaller version. Okay, you can link to things in quarter documents. Uh, you can just copy paste the link that will work. But if you want some other text and then for people to click on that text and that, take, that should take them to some website, that's how you would write it. So the text that they should see in square brackets. And then in round brackets, you put the actual URL, right? And then this is what it shows up as. You can see if I click on it, I'll open it in a new window or new tab rather. And that takes me to the quarter website. Okay, so that's the syntax for that. Square brackets and then round brackets for the link. Okay, and a couple of things that you might or might not need. Superscript with carrots. And then these little squiggly lines for um, strike through, right? If you need to strike through text. Okay. Yeah, so next I'd invite you to play around with these options. So we have a half sentence, which is penguins are very cute. Turn that into a block quote. We have a link to Alison Horst's GitHub page, format that more nicely. And then there are a couple of things that should be converted into lists. Okay, so again, a couple of minutes to play around with that and let me know when you're done or when you'd like me to move on. But whether you can make a new page and so on. So I guess that, that makes sense um, for Word. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense for Word, exactly. I'll show a little bit of that later. We'll, we're focusing on HTML, but I'll show a little bit of Word um, later on as well.
and just an ad uh, on several people said they can't use the email feature. I investigated. I also, for me, it doesn't work, but it's documented as you said. So I think maybe maybe some bug with the theme or something like that. Yeah, I'll I'll have a look and see if I can figure out what's going wrong. We should <laughs> move on. Um, and yeah, as I said, if, if something's too fast for you, if you'd like more time to play around with it, you do have the um, yeah quarter demonstration, which has all this, all the exercises solved, basically. You can have a look at that later if you like. Okay, so another element that is super useful um, would be a table of contents. We need that a lot. Uh, we would like that a lot. So this is also an option in the YAML where we can just write TOC, table of contents, uh, true. We can specify how deep the table of contents should be. So TOC depth. So how many levels of subheadings should be shown in it. Default is three as far as I know. So if you'd like fourth and fifth level and so on, subheadings to be shown as well in the table of contents, you could change that from three to four or five and so on. There's an option to say TOC float true that will place the table of contents next to the document. So not on top, but next to it in, in the margins kind of. Um, and you can collapse it. So if it's in the margins, you can say it should be open by default and show the subheadings as well, or it should be, it should just show the main um, headlines. And we can change whether we want to number sections or not. So do we just want the headlines as they are? Or do we want one, 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.2 and so on? And this should be done automatically. So that's very handy. You don't have to worry about um, numbering this by hand, but this should just work automatically. Okay. And this is what that looks like. So in the YAML, uh, in the YAML, you have format and then HTML indented. And then you can add all these options for the table of contents, right? You, if you want a table of contents and you don't really care about anything else, this is enough. This is the line that will give you a table of contents. But if you want to specify it a bit more, you can think about which level of subheadings do I want to include? Do I want this to be at the top or to the side of the document? Do I want it to be open or do I want it to just show the main headlines? Um, so here I've made a suggestion, add a table of contents with numbered sections, but you can also just take a few minutes and play around with that. See, see what, what you prefer. Do you want it to be um, floating or not collapsed or not? So just a few minutes and let me know when you want me to continue. So maybe that's one of these things. Yeah. Okay, but generally you get the um, you get the idea of adding a table of contents. So I think we should move on, so that we can finally talk about code, because we've talked about text a lot. Um, but obviously we uh, want to be able to show code or use code um, in our quarter documents. So all code in your quarter document needs to be in a code chunk. So I'm just switching to our studio for a second to show you. So here's a code chunk. Right. Um, I'm creating a plot that you'll see later. It's a really simple plot. And to add a new code chunk, you click on this green button here at the top. Hope you can see it. Click on it, and you have a new code chunk. Okay. There's also a keyboard shortcut, so you can either click on this button or you can use a keyboard shortcut. Uh, you can label these code chunks so you can better navigate your document in our studio and they can be several words but they need to be unique so you can only use the same name uh, once per document otherwise you'll get a, a render error so for example in your demonstration you can see the first code block this here is called library and data second one is called inspection and you can see i just typed in the name after this this little r um, letter and i said navigation is easier and what I mean by, by that is I can click here and I can see the chunks, I can see the headlines and I can see the chunks and the chunk labels. And that makes it easier to jump from one code block to the next. Okay, we have a, actually a ton of different options for how the code and how the code output should show up in the knitted or rendered um, document. And we have a lot of options for these here. So we can set 
echo false if we want the output to be shown but not the code. We can set include to false to hide both the output and the code. Um, warning, or we can also do error false to suppress warning messages or error messages. And we can also say that the code shouldn't be run, shouldn't be evaluated with eval false. And these options go at the top of a code block, right? So you need this hashtag pipe, and then you can type in echo or include or whatever you want, right? So for example, in your, um, yeah, in your document, we have for the first code block, we have warning false and message false here. Let's zoom in a little bit. So we have here warning false and message false. And that means that when I read in this data and load the tidyverse, I don't get any messages. Usually I get messages that say, um, here are the tidyverse packages and this is what the data looks like that you've loaded. And I don't want that. So I'm setting these options. Okay. Um, and what we can also do is fold code chunks. So this is really um, helpful if you want code to be hidden, but you want the user to be able to click on a button that says code, and then the user can see what the code looks like. So this is when you have a document that you want to send to several people. Um, some people might only be interested in the graph, so other maybe model output, things like that. But other people might also want to see how you did it. So they want to see your code. And the option here is just code, oops, code fold is true. And then if you put that into a code chunk, um, the user can click on a code button to see the code, but by default, it should be hidden. And all of these options, so code fold, but also these options here, you can use them in the code blocks, in the code chunks, but you can also set them as global options. So for all code chunks in the document, you can set them as global options. And that's in the YAML. Underneath HTML, you can say code fold true, for example, that then applies to all the code blocks, or you can say warning false. So that means that no warning should be shown for any um, code block. Okay, so now my suggestion would be that you try it by um, adding an option in a code chunk so that only the output is visible. So the, the code that says head penguins, uh, you only want the output to be visible, but not the code. And the very first code chunk, see if you can fold that. So this first code chunk, see if you can fold that. And again, let me know in the chat when you're done with that. Okay, a few people seem to be done. So thanks for letting me know. And I think we should move on. Um, oh yeah, let me actually show you what it looks like. So you should be able to say code fold, fold is true for the first code block here and echo is false to not see the code. All right, another feature that's really useful is inline code. So this is when you want to execute code in the text. Uh, for example, you want to refer to the average distance in some data frame. You can use inline code like this. So backticks R and then the R command that you want to be executed. And this assumes that we have a data frame called DF and a variable called um, distance. And then this will replace this R code by the actual value for the average distance in your data frame, right? So this is super useful. So code that is in these back ticks will be run and then this output will be shown in your text. Um, and why is this helpful? So basically it saves you from having to copy paste numbers, um, especially if those numbers might still change. You can also use that for, you can use that for descriptive statistics and also for elements of a model summary without having to copy paste um, every single value. Okay. Um, yeah, so when we're using Python or Julia, yes, we can do, we should be able to do the same thing um, with Python or Julia. Yeah, so this R is just telling Quarto that 
the following is going to be our code. Okay, so a little exercise if you like. Um, there's a line that says we've removed missing values here and then there's inline code to show the number of rows in the data frame. So this line, and you can see here this backtick R and then N row penguins because that's the name of the data frame. But if you go um, further down a little bit, you can see some descriptive statistics. The average bill length is question mark millimeters. The average bill depth is question mark millimeters and so on. The data was collected between which year and what year. So, and this can all be replaced by inline code. So take a few minutes and see if you can figure out how to do that. Okay, so a few people seem to be done. Um, thanks, Crystal, for figuring out that table of contents um, error, uh, replacing underscore with hyphen. That makes sense. So that ha actually happens a lot that in our markdown, you have something underscore something, and in quarter, you instead need a hyphen. So if, if you get an error and you have something with an underscore, try replacing that with a hyphen, and that might work. Okay, so I'll show you the code that I have for this, uh, which looks like this. Ignore this column stuff, we'll talk about that later. But you can write R mean penguins bill length and mean penguins bill depth. And for year, you can write min penguins year and max penguins year. And then in the document that should be replaced uh, by, yeah, by the actual values, right? Here, and the data was collected between 2009, uh, seven and nine. Okay, so super, super helpful, this inline code. Okay, so what we need to do, or what we probably want to do a lot is add either external pictures, external files, or also graphs that we made in R. So to add these external, add an external file, you use code that looks like this. You have an exclamation mark, uh, square brackets. Um, that's the label that you wanted to have. So quarter logo in this case, and here's that, what that label looks like. And then you have the actual file name in round brackets. So the file, this should also be in, in the folder somewhere. Yeah, here it is. So it's quarto underscore logo dot PNG. That goes into round brackets. And then I also have curly brackets. So here, this is basically um, a quick way of referring to this, uh, to this picture that I can use in a sentence like, like this, refer to and then add fig logo, because that's what I've called it for the quarto logo. And then this will automatically be changed into refer to figure one for the quarter logo. So you'll notice um, this labeling and counting happens automatically. So figure one, I didn't have to write that. It was just done for me. And then in the text, I can, I can refer back to this picture. And this also works in Word documents. And this is super useful in Word documents. So you don't have to, you know, copy paste pictures or copy paste graphs and uh, label them by hand, make sure that the numbering is correct and things like that. This is all done automatically for you, right? So the important thing here in the curly brackets is to specify that this is a figure. So this fig, that's you need to stick to that and then hyphen. And I've called it logo. So this is actually the name that you can set. Um, yeah, you can pick that, but you need to tell Quarter that this is a figure. So it can label it as figure and then one counting up. Okay. And so here, this working directory um, logic comes in because this logo is saved in the same spot as on the same folder as my Quarto document. I can just write the name of the file 
and I don't need to do anything else and it's able to find it. If it's in a subfolder, you can instead write name of the subfolder and then name of the picture. So if this was in a subfolder and the subfolder was called sub, then this is what I would write instead of just writing the name of the file. And note that you need the file ending. So this is a PNG, but if you have a JPEG or something like that, this needs to be included. Okay. So my suggestion here would be, we have some descriptive statistics and maybe we want to illustrate that by um, some penguin drawings by Alison Horst and also an illustration that explains what we're actually talking about with these build dimensions. And you have both these files, they are in the subfolder pics, right? Cat pictures for later, but we have these two um, pictures here. And now we'd like to add those to our quarter document. So these are in the subfolder. So you'll need to make sure that you refer to the subfolder when you write code. And you should also label them like this so you can refer back to them later on. Okay, and as always, let me know when you're done. Okay, some people are done. Um, I can show you what this looks like for me. Ignore some of this other formatting um, stuff around it. We'll get to that later. Um, but this would be the code. You can of course choose what you yeah, what the caption should be here. I've picked penguin species and so on. And then you need to make sure to include the uh, subfolder and the complete name and then the figure name. So fig penguins and then fig bill as well. You can see in Quarto, you get a little preview as well, which, which helps you make sure that this was found. You've got the name right, you've got the subfolder right. Okay. Okay, so when you've added these pictures, they are shown underneath each other, but we can also arrange them to be next to each other. So here, and now this is where the cat pictures come in. Uh, we have a layout with two columns and then two pictures next to each other. I'll show you for a second what that looks like. Looks like this, All right? So now we have two pictures placed next to each other with captions. And the way the code works is you have these three columns, then in these uh, curvy brackets, um, you write layout hyphen n calls so a number of columns equals two. You can also play around with number of rows instead, whatever works best. And then you just insert the two pictures as before. You have an empty line in the middle and then you basically close this layout with, with another three colons to tell Quarto, here's where a new layout starts. And then you add the two pictures and here's where that layout ends, right? And then it arranges them next to each other because I said, I want two columns, right? So that means next to each other. Okay. We can do something similar with, um, columns of text, so not columns of uh, pictures, but also columns of text. So here I have an example um, of a column with that takes up 20% of the space, and then a larger column that takes up 80% of the space. So this again is wrapped in columns, right? So dot columns with these curly brackets. And then I'm specifying the first column width, 20%. This is the text that should go into it. And then I'm closing this. And then I'm doing the same thing for the wider column. So column width is 80%. And then this is the text that goes into this wider column. And you can of course set whatever percentage you want. You can also do that with more than two columns. I've just picked this as an example. You can see how it shows up here. It's a little bit cut off, but you get the idea. This is the 20% column on the left. And then this is the 80% column on the right. Okay. Um, right, so we've talked about how to add external files. So external graphs or pictures, but of course you'll very often want to use code, R code, um, create a picture and then refer to it, create a graph and then refer to it. And that works similarly as with these external pictures. In the code block where you make the graph, you write label and then 
again, fig for figure. So quarter knows this is a figure, hyphen, and then your label, whatever you want to call it. And you can also add a caption with fig cap and then type in whatever you like. The caption will be shown under the graph. And again, the graphs will be automatically numbered because you use this fig hyphen and then gave it a label. So quarter automatically counts up for you. And then you can use this label to refer to the graph. So this is exactly the same logic as with these external pictures or graphs. All right, so I've made a little plot here. Um, not, yeah, not maybe not the most exciting plot, just a quick example of animal rescue costs um, in London by hour. So you can see the longer it takes to rescue a, a cat or bird or dog, or fox or whatever, um, the more it costs um, measured in pounds, right? And you can see this is figure two because figure one was one of the, uh, one of the other graphs that I showed earlier. So this was labeled automatically and you can see it links to it, right? So this was exactly the same as with these external pictures. Again, this is very useful in Word, for example. All right. So in the document that you have, you have a couple of graphs that I already made. So you have code for a couple of graphs. And I would challenge you to add a label and a caption to the first graph that we have. Write a sentence that refers to that graph. And you can also write something that refers to the drawing that you added earlier that explains how bill length and depth are actually measured. And if you like, you can also try arranging these two penguin pictures you added so that they're next to each other. And if you also would like to do that, you can format the text that it's underneath with the average um, bill length and stuff like that. You can also format that so it's um, displayed in two columns. And for this kind of stuff, I would recommend that you just open the slides and copy paste things like that. It's really easy to make, you know, to forget a colon or to yeah, make some kind of a mistake here. So this is stuff that I would always just copy paste, to be honest. OK, so in the interest of time, I think I'll show you how I did it, um, what my code looks like and what it looks like in the final document. I'll actually yeah, show you the final document first. So you'll remember these two pictures. And these are now arranged side by side. Uh, this we'll talk about later. Uh, this graph for the entire data, you can see it has a label, penguin flipper length and body mass. Here's a reference to figure two. You can see I click on it and it jumps me up to figure two. So that's very useful. And then also, so yeah, you can see it, this is flipper length and body mass just for all the penguins in this data set. Uh, and this is the same graph, but now we have it separately for each species, for each of the three species. And here's a sentence where I've explained that. So I've said figure three does not separate the data by species, while figure four does. And again, you can see I'm referencing these figures and I can click on them and it takes me to the correct figure. So let's look at the code. Here, this is the layout. So this is exactly what I showed you with, with my cat pictures here. We have the three colons, layout and call. So number of columns equals two. And then we have the two pictures that you've added earlier. And then here, this is for putting the text into two columns. So this looks like this. So this is one column, average bill length. And then the data was collected between these two years. That's another column. And the code for that looks like this. So similar to the one that I showed you, but the column width is 50, 50, 50, right? 50% for each of these two blocks, text blocks. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. Right, um, so next we'll talk about references. This is super useful for, especially for academic articles, but for all kinds of reports. Um, usually you want to make a reference to the author and 
the year of a text that you're referencing to or that you're quoting from. Um, you want to do that in the body of the text. So just usually just author and year depends kind of on your system, but usually just author and year. But then at the end of the document, you would like to have a bibliography section where you have the full references so people can look for these articles. And this is um, easy to do in, in um, Quarto if you use a reference software, so reference management software like Zotero, um, because what you need is a, is a bib file, so .bib file that contains the references you need for a specific project. You can go to Zotero or whichever program you use and export the citations you need for a document into a bib file. And then you just put that into the same folder as your Markdown document. And in the YAML at the top, you just add big bibliography and then whatever this bib file is called. I'll show you in a second what that looks like. And then the second uh, line here, link citations, yes. So this is useful because this will let people click on an in-text reference and take you to the bibliography to the correct reference in the bibliography. So that's what link citations does, right? So, and let's look at the bib file. Uh, I have this one open. So this is also in my repository. There are just two references here. So you can see at article, this is the, um, the text type, and then this is author and year. And this is what you actually need to remember. So Gorman 2014, this opens in Visual Studio Code, but you can also open it in any text editor really. And then it has all kinds of information, has the abstract in here, the um, author, year, the title, right? All the information that you need to refer to um, a journal article in this case. And then the second reference is Horst 2020. That's its, its short name and that's what we need later on. This is the Palmer Penguins package, right? Because this um, penguin data is also available in this package. So this is the second reference. So remember these two, Haas 2020 and Gorman 2014, we'll need these um, because this is the reference ID, right? So each source in your bib file has a reference ID um, and that's what you need to refer to this um, text or book or website or whatever in Markdown. You can just write at and then reference ID. If you want your reference to be in brackets, you have to use square brackets around that. And you can also do that with several references, right? If you just have several in-text references, you just connect them with a comma. If you have several references that should be in brackets, you should need a semicolon. And of course you can use page numbers. So for an in-text citation with a page number, you put it in square brackets. So here would be 25. If you want that to be, if you want to in, the entire thing to be in brackets, you put that into curly brackets instead and then it'll show up in the text. And really helpfully, Quarto automatically adds all the complete references, the bibliography at the bottom of the document. And it also adds a headline that's, that says references automatically. And then it'll list all the details people need to find these, um, yeah, to find these articles. And what you can also do is alter the citation style so you need to add a line in the YAML to do that, CSL. This is the citation style language. And then you refer to some citation style file. I've also provided one, APA single space dot CSL. That's the one you have available. So this is APA format. And you can download these from Zotero, for example. You can look for, I don't know, Chicago or Harvard or whatever, whatever the style is that you're using. And then you can download this CSL file, just save it next to your quarter document and refer to it in the YAML. And this will change the citation style in the entire document. So this is really, really helpful. Okay, so now to try it, I've given you this penguins bib file. So this is the one that we're looking at here. So add a line to the YAML so that this file can be accessed. You can also change the citation style using the one that I provided, or you can also download another CSL file if you like. And then you, we have a sentence where we explain that the data can also be used in the Palmer Penguins package and was originally introduced in this article. 
And here we want to really add a reference to the Palmer Penguins package, which is Horse 2020, it's that reference. And we also want to replace Gorman and colleagues article by a, a proper reference to this article, which is Gorman 2014. Okay, so once again, let me know uh, once you're done with that. Okay, I think in the interest of time, we should move on, but you have the, the document to refer to and I'll, I'll show you quickly how, um, yeah, what the code looks like and what it looks like in the finished document. So you can see um, here's a reference, right? So this data can be used by the Palmer Penguins package and it says host at all 2020. If I hover over that, it gives me the reference immediately, right? Um, and was originally introduced in Gorman et al. 2014. And again, I can hover over that and it gives me that reference. If I click on it, it jumps me to the bottom of the page where you can see Quarto has helpfully added a references headline with these two references, with these two complete references. And all I had to do in the code was in the YAML, I've added the bibliography, so penguins.bib, because that's what the file is called, link citations, yes, and the CSL, so the citation style, I've used the file that, that I've provided, that's APA is what I tend to use, but yeah, just so you see that this changes it from the, the default um, citation style. And then in the code, let's see where it is, mm -mm, here, this is the relevant um, line can also be used by the package. And then you can see this is a citation that I wanted to be in brackets. So I've used square brackets and written at Horst 2020 and was originally introduced in. And here I, I want no brackets. So I've just had to write at Gorman 2014 and that's all. So I didn't have to use the reference. Uh, it didn't have to add the references, right? This is the end of the document. There's nothing here, Quarto does it automatically. So that's super helpful. Okay, then back to my slides. Okay, so here's a nice um, new addition uh, to Quarto there. These are the things called call out blocks. So these are text blocks that um, have a different color that you can use to draw the reader's attention to something. It can be the note, a tip, um, a warning, um, caution or something important. Uh, and I'll just go to the documentation so you see what these look like, right? So that's what they look like. So note has this little eye information icon uh, is blue. Warning has this, um, yeah, this icon. Important has an exclamation mark. Tip has this light bulb. And then you can also uh, expand or collapse these call out blocks, right? So this is another example of Maybe some of your readers are not interested in some of the, the details, but you can click on that or they can click on that. Your users can click on that and then they see the text, right? So this is super helpful for documentation, um, for any kinds of documents, for teaching is also really, really useful to draw people's attention like make sure that you do this, right? And the syntax for that, so here's a caution example, just as one example. We again need these uh, three columns, curly brackets dot callout, and then you have hyphen, and then you have the type of callout. So is it a caution um, or is it a note, a warning? Yeah, so note, warning, important, tip, or caution. These are the five types. So you specify them by typing callout, hyphen, and then whatever type it is. And then you they have a heading. Right, so this is the callouts title, just with these um, hashtags like you're used to, and then you can add whatever text you like, and that's what it shows up as. Right, so it does this automatically: this formatting, this box, the colors, the little icon. Yeah, super useful. Okay, 
So for HTML documents, you notice that we have quite a lot of space on the margins here, right? So the document is really centered, the text is really centered, and we have a lot of space in the margin. So we can actually put stuff in there if we like. For example, we can set the references to be shown in the margins instead of at the bottom of the document, or the citations also in the margins. Same for the figure captions. So they can be next to your figure, next to your graph, if you use cap location margin in the code chunk. And there are also these things called asides. So for that, you can write text that should be shown in the margin instead of in the main body, shown in the, mar in the margin. So the way to do this is you put your text into square brackets, and then at the end, you put curly brackets dot aside. You can see in slides, this doesn't really work, right? It just, it still puts it at the bottom, but in documents, um, that looks really good. So here, for example, this is an aside by right format and so on. This little block is an aside. It's put in the margins instead of in the main document. Okay, and then of course we can also have footnotes. So let's say I think it, the sentence needs a footnote and then I just use square brackets, um, the caret and one. And then this is what this shows up as. And then at the bottom of the document, or you can see at the bottom of the slide, if you're using slides, you can type this in. So caret one, this is the footnote. And then this is, this is what it shows up as, right? So you can add all kinds of footnotes to your text or to your document. And then one more cool thing, you can use tab sets. So these let you switch between different tabs. So for example, if I have some Veritas color options, style A, I'm gonna show this code that says option equals um, A, and I can switch to style B, right? And you can see the code has changed to say option B, right? So you can switch back and forth um, between the two. And let me show you what that looks like in, um, in the code, because I forgot to add that there. <laughs> so tab sets, this is what they look like, right? So you have three columns and then curly brackets panel tab set. They each have a title, right? So Veritas style A or Veritas style B. So this shows up like this, right? So these are the two tab titles that we can click on. And then because I'm showing, I'm showing our code here, this is what that looks like, right? So this is what is showing up in, in the tabs. Okay. Mm, and yeah, again, for reasons of time, um, I'll show you what, um, yeah, what I've wanted you to do in this exercise here, and you can always play around with it later. So here we have an aside, I already showed you that. And what that looks like um, in the file is, let me look for it. Oh yeah, yeah. So this is the sentence, right? Just in square brackets and then curly brackets aside. We have a bunch of different call out blocks to show you in the document. So here we have a note with a little sentence in it. Here we can say expand to learn more about where the data was collected. So we can click on that and then we get information on where the data was collected. Let me show you the code for that because I think the, the ones that you can expand are especially useful. It's this one, right? So we have call out caution. So caution again, that just refers to it having this orange color and it having this little warning symbol. And then I've added collapse equals true. So that means by default, it's shown closed and pe people can click on it to actually see the text, right? So this is how you do these kind of collapsed um, call out blocks. And then we have another call out block here as a little note. You can also use the, the data via the Palmer Penguins package. And here we have a tab set, so this shows if you want to see code in a specific column, you can use base R syntax, and that's what that syntax looks like. Or you can use tidyverse syntax, and that's what that looks like. And people can um, yeah, switch back and forth between those two options. 
Right. And something you might have noticed in, in this HTML document, when I hover over code, I get this little clipboard symbol, right? And when I click on that, it'll copy paste the code. Uh, oh, it'll copy the code for me and I can paste it somewhere, right? So if you want to um, copy paste someone else's code and they're using a, an HTML, you can just click on that. It'll take the, the code in this box and you can paste it wherever you want. All right, so we've talked a lot about HTML documents. You can also do slides. And in fact, the slides that I'm using here are made in Quarto and they are available on my GitHub. So you can uh, just open the Quarto document um, if you want to see how I did certain things. Um, you can use PowerPoint and PDF for slides too, um, but the equivalent to HTML or what, what we use for HTML format is called Reveal.js. Um, so when you create a new document and you want to use slides, you can just select quarter presentation instead of, instead of quarter document. What's really important to say here is that code isn't shown by default on slides, right? So that's often really confusing, but code is not shown by default. So in the YAML, you have to use something like um, echo true either in the YAML or in the individual code blocks so that code is shown because by default, it's basically switched off. Right. And you have other YAML options. Again, you have things like themes, you have a footer, right? So you can see I'm using a footer here <laughs> in my slides. But yeah, other YAML options that you're probably familiar with, title, description, date, and author, things like that. You can pick a style as before. Slide breaks are, um, are interesting. So for first and second level headlines, so with one or two um, hashtags, uh, Quarto knows that you want a slide break after these probably. But if you want to do this manually, you can use three hyphens and the content below will go on a new slide. Uh, you can use incremental bullet points. So basically, um, this won't be shown at first and you have to click to show the first point and the second point and the third point. And the way to do that is just here incremental or you can also set incremental to true in the YAML and then every, this is true for every slide for your entire presentation. Something that's very cool is highlighting lines of code. Uh, let me uh, show you what that looks like. Uh, so here's the slides demonstration. Okay. So here I have some code and I want to point out that um, we can use geom point, color and shape to show the different penguin species. And I can highlight the two lines of code by writing code line numbers four hyphen five. And then these lines will show up in kind of a darker color and everything else will be a little grayed out, right? So you can draw people's attention to specific lines of code. That's really helpful, especially when you're teaching. And yeah, a couple of words about other output formats, because we did talk a lot about HTML. Um, Word and PDF, there's one useful thing here that you can insert page break um, to add a page break, make sure the next text or code is, is put on the next um, page. Uh, for PDF, you might also need to install LaTeX uh, so that it knits or compiles or renders properly. But generally, you can just change the output format in the YAML, and then it should, most of the options will work pretty well. Same with Word, where you shouldn't really need additional packages, but just you do need Word to be installed or something like OpenOffice. And again, you just change the output um, and most of this renders totally fine. A couple of options are not available. So code folding, that might not work in Word. And finally, I wanted to show you one last trick that I found really helpful. So you might have something like, um, like a corporate design or you might have a, in Word, you might have a font, um, font colors and sizes and margins and things like that, that you always use um, and that you want to reuse for your newly rendered Quarto Word documents. So what you can actually do is create a template, um, like a Word template, and then refer to that. So the way that works is you make one really simple quarter document that just has everything that you need. So all the headline levels that you use, um, some text, things like that, but it can be very short. There doesn't need to be a lot in it. Then you render it to Word, 
in Word, you open it and make any changes you want to make. So things like page dimensions, do you want this to be letter or A4? Um, what font, what font sizes do you want? How big should the margins be? What are the settings for the different um, levels of, of headings, right? Things like that. You can make all these changes, you save it. And then in your main quarter document, you go to the YAML and you refer to that document you just made. This is your reference document. You write in the YAML reference doc and then the name of the custom reference um, document that you created. And then when you render this quarter document, uh, this will look up the reference document, look up the, all the settings, page dimensions, font, font sizes, margins, and so on. And the document that you render then is going to look exactly like your reference document. So this is very helpful. You can make one reference document and then just refer to it in all your future quarter documents. And then the, the documents, when you render them, they will look exactly the same as your reference document. So super helpful. All right. Yeah, that was a bit of a whirlwind. I hope this was helpful. Um, and yeah, I'm available for any further questions uh, that you might have. Also feel free to get in touch with me via Twitter, if you like. Um, that's probably the best way to get in touch with me. I'm also in the Slack. Right. If you want to message me in the Slack, that's also very welcome. Uh, we have a few more minutes, so if there are any more questions, very happy to answer. And if not, I hope you have a great day and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks a lot, Julia, for the very, very informative session. Really cool. Thank and you. Really cool what you can do with Quarto and also to see what you actually did already with your presentation <laughs> in Quarto. That's yeah. nice. Um, but one reminder for those of you, if you exit the Zoom afterwards, after the session, you can get your um, credentials, um, digital credentials, if you just enter your um, name and email address there. I'll post it, uh, the message again also if you want to claim them via email. But we have more some time for questions. So if you have questions, I think you can post them. I was wondering about one thing, Julia, and that is mm -hmm. if you create a presentation, a PowerPoint, you probably can do the same, that you have a reference doc there as well, right? That's, yeah. Mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. really helpful, I guess, for many people. Yes. So, um, yeah, things like references, bibliography, that also works in, in presentations. Yeah. I mean, also like a reference, like a template. Like a template oh, like a template. Mm. And then you reference that. Oh, and that's what you mean. Um, so we do that in PowerPoint and Markdown as it, if you, oh, if it works in Markdown, then it probably works in Quarto. I haven't tried that, so I don't know for sure, but I would assume that it works um, in Quarto as well. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'm actually writing some chapters of my um, PhD of my dissertation in Quarto. So this reference document was, was very, very helpful. And I just figured that out a few weeks ago. <laughs> so I thought nice. I'd include it. Uh, bugs and issues for Quarto, I would assume on the website somewhere, maybe help report a bug. See, so if you go to quarto.org, um, at the top you have help, and if you click on that, you have report a bug as one of the options. But probably it's a good idea to, I mean, there's a lot here, so you can also check, first of all, um, to see if your bug is already reported so, you, so they don't get the same reports all and over again. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for joining.